Kia ora welcome to another episode of Inside Netball. We've got another big one on our hands. Catherine Cox will be joining us for a chat about the recent, na recently named Australian Diamond Squad and to hear her thoughts ahead of the World Cup. But before we get into that, Jenny Woods, Anna Stanley, round nine of the ANZ Premiership. Let's talk about that. The big game of the weekend was supposed to be the Mystics Tactics game, but it kind of wasn't. Uh, Mystics won 74 to 50. No Jane Watson for the Tactics. Is she worth 24 goals? <laughs> well, I wouldn't have thought so. Um, I, I don't mean, think I, anyone is. No, I? well, it, you'd hope not. I mean, it just—it was strange, wasn't it? Because that was going to be the big game, and the night before wasn't so much the big game, but of course that was the big game because it was so exciting. But no, to answer your question, Storm, I thought the rest of the tactics didn't quite turn up, um, particularly in you know that shooting circle. They've got a few problems there. I think they were a lot better in their later game in the round. But um, no, I just th think it'll be interesting to see where they go from here. Yeah, it was a thumping, wasn't it? And I think it was a real opportunity for those other players to stand up. You know, when you've got a leader like Jane Watson that uh, can't play, that's when other players like Pa Selby Rickett, Camille Rapoi, the other and, you know, leaders in the team need to go, OK, right, this is my opportunity to really lead. And I just feel that they didn't and it was a real opportunity for them. I thought Nolene Tarua would have probably been watching because the, at the back end of the ANZ Premiership, this is where you need your big time players to stand up. And saying that, TP had a bad game against the Mystics. She turned it around 24 hours later and put in a 100% shooting performance. So Knowles would have been happy with, with the fact that she turned it around. But I think we need to see that intensity from these players straight away. I thought, yeah, there were just too many mistakes. And, you know, much as, I, you know, we love Karen Berger, but I just noticed a few times she would do something, you know, sensational and then throw the ball away. And, you know, she used to do that quite a bit and she got that out of her game. So I don't know whether or not that was, that was just a, a bit of a blip. I like that you uh, brought up Karen Berger because, Annie, you're talking about players standing up. And she definitely did. I mean, she had yeah. seven intercepts in that match. I feel like I was lucky to get seven in a season. So, <laughs> like, she was incredible. And Kate Lloyd got stuck in. But I noticed that her turnover stats were really high too, Jen. And I wonder if we so often see her get an incredible intercept or do something amazing and just find an offload to Jane really quickly. And not having that release just meant that they just weren't able to get that flow on that turnover attack. To Pia Selby Rickett, though, you're right, Annie, put up nearly 30 goals at 100% mm. over the pulse. But the rest of her numbers were down. It wasn't I, anywhere yeah, with the you know, no. centre pass and feeds. I think when you're talking about Berger hash, with those turnovers, I think that's been a real problem with the tactics, is their ability to have options onto the ball. I mean, there was one quarter, I think the second quarter, they went four minutes without shooting a goal and then five minutes in another quarter. So to me, that suggests... People aren't doing the work, they're not available, and so perhaps when Berger gets an intercept and she needs someone to pass to, there's no one there and, and it's a turnover. So I think that's been a resounding thing that's come through the whole season with the tactics. And I talked to um, Julie Seymour, Donna um, Wilkins at the end of the game, and they were just both pulling their hair out. You know, they're like, how much, how much more can we do? You know, you need to have to uh, want the ball. An interesting thing that they also said is these days, these girls are so stats driven. And it was quite interesting that, you know, when, I don't know, when I played, it was, stats wasn't a big thing, but now players are playing to their stats. So perhaps they don't want to put the ball up because it's too far and they're not going to get it in, or they don't want to throw that pass in because it might be a bad pass and it will be a bad, bad cross beside their name. So I thought that was a little interesting thing that uh, players are perhaps playing a little bit too much to stats. I remember hearing about, yeah, Lenise Pockeater when she was here for, what was she doing? Playing with the magic. And I know there was a sort of a bit of a feeling that she was very worried about her goal percentage. And if it was a bit far away, you know, yeah. she wouldn't put it up. But just thinking about those connections and the, um, the tactics, I mean, I guess they've had a bit of disruption, Greer Sinclair out. Uh, and I know there was comment made in the one of the games that, you know, those, they're still building that connection with Paris Lokatui. She's fortuitously come in so perhaps that's one and I just wonder if Laura Malcolm has turned out to be not the import that she probably not could the have import been. that she could have been no. and how long do you give players opportunities to keep building these connections it's like they should be straight in well the season's nearly over <laughs> connecting straight away it's Maybe we're just possibly putting around a little bit too much. I feel like we could spend the whole episode talking about the tactics, to be honest, because they're one of those teams that just have these moments mm. of brilliance, kind of like the Pulse and the Stars. Do we want to talk about the consistency of these teams? Because you said, Jen, the game of the round was actually the Pulse against the Steel. 
where the steel nearly won and the pulse only won by one. I mean, how is that possible when we see the stars have moments of brilliance, brilliance sorry, and then play really badly against other teams? Is that a cause for concern? Well, I think it might be. I think we have to give some credit, though, to the steel. Yeah. I mean, I think they played really well. And I was looking at um, Saviour Tui's numbers, and they were, you know, outstanding. And She's been so, the difference, I think, for the Yes. Season, well, and I was very pleased to see Kate Burley named the player of the game for that one, even though she was in the losing side. And I know it was only one mm. goal, but I think too often, you know... You feel like you've got to give it to the winning team. Yes. And you think, well, actually... Um, there might have been better ones than the other one. But yeah, going back to the Stars and the... Um, Pulse and Pulse. Tactics, that those three teams in particular, kind of fighting for the two spots in the top three, assuming the Mystics yeah. are going to be there. Tactics have got four games. They've got two extra games in hand, I think. They're, they're playing four they've games. They've got four more. Yeah. Pulse and Stars have three more. Yeah, so they've got one extra game, yes. sorry. Yes. Um, and, you know, if they if they get maximum points, I mean, they, they can still get there um, ahead of... The pulse and the stars. Well, yes. Well, let's wait and see. I mean, a part of me would really like to see that, but you see, I'm so wishy-washy, flippy-floppy. <laughs> I just, I think, oh yes, no, I'd like you to be. Oh, and oh, I'd like you to be there. Well, I had tactics at the beginning of the season. I was for sure it was going to be the Mystics, and it, for sure it was going to be tactics. Same. Final. Totally and same. And they have been, yeah, underwhelming for me this year. The tactics, and I find that hard to say, given that I'm a, I'm a keen tab at heart. Um, yeah. So. It Just makes it exciting. The last three rounds, we don't know who's going to be there. Well, exactly. That's a great way to look at it, too. Yeah. I'm the doom and glooming person. It's like, oh, well, the inconsistency <laughs> is this a worry. <laughs> it is great that the competition has been so great. So we are grateful for that. Back to your point about the stats, Annie. Just I had a little light bulb moment. Yeah. When I was in the Fern squad over those sort of few years uh, and you were playing in the ANZ Premiership, every week you'd get an email from Bobby, who used to be the stats lady, or whoever's running mm. the stats, and every position would be rated. So you'd have the top 10, it'd be like number one, Jane Watson, goal keep, two, Kelly Jury, blah, blah, blah. And it would be all based on your stats. And the entire squad got sent this email. Gosh. And so you had every stat possible mm. covered and converted into sort of a rating for you as a player. So I'm not surprised to hear that players are worried about this mm. because it's a big way that they're being judged. Were stats a big thing? No, when you, not yeah. really. And I, and I hear it was when Waimarama Tamanu came in and coached because she was very much all about the stats and that was when Bobby was the yes. statistician. Yeah. So I think it was uh, that was the turning point when Y came in. Uh, no, stats wasn't a big thing. Hey, if it was, I, I would not have been in teams. <laughs> For every amazing pass I did, I had about five bad ones. <laughs> so I would have been. They were fast though. Not in the team. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting though about stats because we I did a um, uh, Synergy Hair League game on whatever day it was, and they um, quite a debate, just in talking to one of the managers beforehand, about the use of schoolgirls in this league. And they have to get a special dispensation. And to get that dispensation, you have to submit numbers. And I had just assumed you would just say, well, look, you know, little Anna Robry, she's showing great promise. And, well, you would have been then at school, surely. Uh, and... Um, but no, it's, it's on your Broncos or your yo-yos or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was, would have been more about your, your mental, um, not your mental state, but your maturity. Mm -hmm. your, because as we know, there are schoolgirls and schoolgirls. But I thought that was quite an interesting point that she made and, and one that I think we'll probably hear about more of. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't aware of that, mm. so that is interesting. Looking ahead to round 10, the big game of the weekend will be the Stars versus the Tactics. Any predictions there? <laughs> Well, will Jane Watson be available? I mean, what well, have you heard? It. Yeah, any. I mean, yeah. we were just talking about this. Well, I She's think she, okay. she was able to play one game of the round, but she chose not to. Um, because she's thinking of the long game. Of course, it's the World Cup. So it sounds like uh, from that that she would be available this weekend. You'd hope so. I mean, the big air cast on her leg was a little bit off-putting. Yeah. But, yeah, managing injuries and, and loading is a thing that we talk about all the time and you have to do all the time. So fingers crossed she will be fine for that match. But it's really, I mean, it's not quite must-win, but it's going to say a lot about who deserves to be in that top three, that game this weekend. Well, it does. And, but the thing now, with that close result for the Steel last round, uh, it makes me think, well, you know, what are they going to pull yeah. out? Because that would have given them such confidence. And yes, I know, they've, they've got two games. First one against the Mystics. And look, they were superb the other day, night. But um, look, you'd start believing, wouldn't you, if you were a Steel supporter? Maybe. Hitting form at just the right time. Let's hope they get a win. 
in the last three rounds. Do you just feel though in those dying moments they just don't have the experience or the players to be able to pull it off? I don't know I just even you know they had the ball and they had possession to win that match but no part of me ever felt like they were gonna oh, win. That was, that was frustrating wasn't it? The, yeah. the passing it around and, and I'm all for passing it around but to a point and the point had they'd gone past that point and of course you invite the defenders to come in and have a devil so that was frustrating and yes that's because they they lack that experience down that attack end for sure and how many times have we talked about that this season the mm. playing the ball around of course there's no um hard and fast rule in that no. and of course we know the teams coach these scenarios they practice these scenarios so we're just waiting to see it on the other foot <laughs> see it pull off and i'm sure that might happen in the final three rounds or maybe the uh, final series mm. Uh, well, that's probably enough of our local competition here, the ANZ Premiership. Let's now head across the ditch and catch up with Australian netball legend Catherine Cox. Hello, Kat. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, no, the pleasure is all ours. First off, how are you and what has 2023 looked like for you so far? Yeah, I am fabulous. Um, thank you. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Sydney, which has been few and far between. Um, but no, it's been busy so far. We've just hit round seven, so halfway through the Suncorp Super Netball season. Um, and it's been unreal. We've had so many close games and the table's just changing pretty big most weeks. So it's been fantastic so far. And Kath, the big news, I guess, the other day was um, Stacey Marinkovic naming her squad. I mean, it's a big squad. It's like 19 players. So, you know, who's going to miss out? Because a lot of players have to fall out of that group. Yeah, well, it's scary, isn't it? But she has still got up to 22. So she can throw another three in there if she wants to prior to the selection being made. I don't think she will. I think if she does that, she's just selecting for numbers, not necessarily players she genuinely thinks will make the team. Uh, but it's going to be a really, really close selection. You know, we've been trying to pick it, uh, even this squad, for obviously weeks, and we found it really hard to land on, you know, just even the 19 names. So to whittle it down to 12, although there is now the three extra that will be mm. travelling um, over, which I think is fantastic finally to, to get to that point. Uh, but it's going to be a really, really tough selection. And, I mean, the squad is so incredibly flexible. There's a number of ways Stacey Marinkovic could go. She's probably just going to have to look at matching up on certain countries. And I think Jamaica is one of the biggest threats at the moment from what we've seen. It's a bit like us over here, Kath. We, we're changing our Silver Fern squad every week. The competition is so tight in New Zealand, even when you look at the midcourt and the shooting end. Where in that 19 is the competition the greatest? Oh, God, it's probably in the midcourt, to be fair, I think. In the shooting end, in the defence end, there's ones that are standing out. Yeah. I think, you, well, that's not entirely true either. I don't, <laughs> it's just really hard. But across the midcourt, if you think of uh, Paige Hadley, Jamie Lee Price, mm. Maddie Proud, um, oh gosh, Kate Maloney, Liz Watson, all of them on par at the moment. The one big surprise is probably Alice Teague Neal from the West Coast Fever not making the cut. Um, I asked Stacey Marenkovic about that uh, and she said that while she hasn't made this World Cup side, it's not completely over for her. So I think we'll see her in the near future. And interesting, isn't it, about Sophie Garvin? I mean, she's a player who um, earlier in the year when uh, you lost that, you know, the shooter Gretel Boetta with great news, having a baby. But And we thought, oh, my goodness, you know, this, is this our chance? Is this our chance? But, of course, <laughs> up came Sophie Garvin. But she's not playing at shooter, is she? She's playing at goal attack for the Magpies. No, and this is another thing we grilled Stacey Marinkovic about. This is what happens when you get the national coach on our show over <laughs> here. We put them through the grilling. But um, she said that it's probably added a string to her bow too. You know, she's obviously a bit fitter. Um, having to be able to play goal attack for a full season means that they could throw her in there internationally if they have to because she's had that sort of practice and that training under her belt. But, yeah, not ideal. We still really don't have that strike shooter. Uh, and Stacey Marinkovic said that ideally we do have one. Uh, at the moment, it looks like it's Danielle Wallam that might take that position, I think. But um, we'll just see how we go. It's a tough one for Sophie Garvin, but at least she's in there and she's got another seven rounds to prove herself. Just on back to Alice Teague Neal, Kath, um, what we kind of remember Alice as was a goal attack who was a little bit hesitant to put the shot up, wasn't doing so well in that position. And you're just telling us she was unlucky to miss out. So she's been playing wing attack, I take it. She's been playing wing attack and she's been in the team of the week for the, well, she was in the team of the week for the first five rounds. 
unstoppable. Liz Watson only just managed to get into the team of the week, um, the last round gone. So she's been playing out of the skin. And, yes, she's playing with Janelle Fowler. And I think there's a lot of criticism around that. And, you know, how hard is it? I could probably feel, feed Janelle Fowler. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's where she's probably missed out in selection this time around is they're thinking it's a lot easier to get a ball into someone like Fowler. But my argument is you still got to get free she barely makes any mistakes when she's got the ball in hand and she's creating a stack of play for the West Coast Fever. They're sitting at the top of the table. So there's something obviously going really right over there in the West. So, yeah, I think she was really unlucky not to at least make the squad. Uh, but, yeah, she might be there in the near future by the sound of it. And let's hope so. She deserves it. You talk about having a strike shooter, Kath. We've got we've got one of those back here in, in New Zealand, and her name's Grace Nowicki. Now, when you when Stacey Marinkovic names her twelve, do you think she has an eye on how to shut down Grace Nowicki? Oh, look, she's got an eye on how to shut down everyone, <laughs> starting starting with her. But there's plenty of players that I think internationally uh, we're concerned about, and I guess some of the biggest ones are the Jamaicans because we're mm. seeing them every single week over here in our competition. But most likely. Uh, Nueki will be on at the top of the list as well, but you've got a stack of players we'll be wary of. But um, you know, Courtney Bruce will be one of the the definites in that Australian side, no doubt, and she loves the challenge on the taller players. Um, we've seen her going head to head with El Cardwell over here. My God, I could watch that all day. That has been so good. The two of those two, so physical, and just love that mental battle, trying to get into each other's heads. Well, speaking of defence, one of the bolters of this squad, I guess, would be Matilda Garrett. Uh, people over here might not be as familiar with the defender. What can you tell us about her and her inclusion? Yeah, she originally started with the Collingwood Magpie. She's only 24, so she's only in her fourth year of, um, of SSN. Uh, made the move to the Adelaide Thunderbirds. And she was on the bench for the majority of last year behind the two Jamaicans in Shamira Sterling and Natanya Wilson. But this year, she's crept herself into goal defence. So she's got Sterling behind her and Wilson in front of her. And it is near impossible to get the ball through that defence line at the moment. Um, and again, she's one of those players you could argue, well, how hard is it to get an intercept when you've got one of those in front, one behind? Like, they're incredible athletes and they're pulling in so much ball. But she's doing a fantastic job. So I feel like the inclusion into the actual team might be a little trickier for her. Um, you know, combinations wise, she hasn't got any in, in Adelaide with the Adelaide Thunderbirds, and there's very little time for this team to come together post SSN and before the World Cup. Kath, something I've always wondered about since the beginning of the SSN and, the, you know, the two point shots, the, the timeouts, the, the, the subtle rule differences between, you know, the game that you're playing there and the international rules. And we've seen a little bit of it here with our ANZ Premiership rules are subtly different. Um, do you think, I mean, do the players need to be given the international rule book to be read once they're <laughs> selected or is it not that bad? I'll give us some credit. <laughs> they're, quite, they're quite intelligent, Jen. No, look, I mean, they're not probably that difficult. And, and the beauty, I think, is that these players are shooting longer shots now in the game more often than not. So when you get to just playing mm. regular time and having to shoot those distant shots, I think there's a, a fair bit more confidence around that. And, you know, for me, the super shot, I was a little bit against it when it started, but I'm so on board now because it's made every game so exciting and no gaps too big to come back from. Um, and we've seen that week in, week out over here in the SSN. But yeah, look, I mean, they're the subtle changes and I, I guess it's more of the chat around getting yourself out of um, problems on court and situations that aren't really working for you without being able to go to those timeouts that the Diamonds may not have the practice in. But they're a, they're a world-class side, so I wouldn't be too concerned about that change. Well, they've done all right, haven't they? They've what? They've Since Stacey Marinkovic came on board, they've I think they've got everything. Com games? Well, not the, World, the Cup. World Cup trophy yes. is the only thing we don't have. So we are going for it. We know you <laughs> Kiwis have got hold of it. And you probably don't want to let it go anytime soon. Uh, but, yes, it's the only one eluding us at the moment. So I think they'll be fully focused on that once we get through this last seven rounds. Hey, Kath, my social media feed went a bit crazy a couple of days ago when your bestie became queen of the jungle. How's Liz going? And how oh, she's so is good, isn't she? I had been trying to get in contact with her for a couple of days right at the very start and couldn't get hold of her. And I was actually genuinely starting to worry. And next minute she pops up in the middle of South African jungle. So um, she's, it's one of my favourite shows. Harper and I watch it every single year. And so the fact that Annie Liz 
was um, suddenly in there was unreal. And, yeah, to see her go on and, and win it was amazing. I mean, we all know how fabulous yeah. she is. We all love her. But it was a chance for the rest of Australia to fall in love with her as well. How so long was she in the jungle Text me this for? morning. Well, she was in there for four weeks. Four so that's weeks. no communication at all with any of the family. You wow. know, it's bad enough being away from the yeah. family when you can FaceTime them and the like. But she did that without any communication. And they all got to go over there and run in and see her at the end. Uh, so there was tears everywhere. But, yeah, she'll be home very soon. I can't wait to catch up with her. Given the tough times, you know, Australian netball has had recently, do you think this timing is, is great? Because obviously the general public have just loved Liz. Yeah, they, they have. I mean, there's plenty going on in Nepal over here for sure, but it's also been really great because it's given us stuff to talk about and mm. put us on the map probably a little bit more. I mean, you don't always want to be on the map for negative things, but what do they say about any publicity is good publicity? Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's nice to have, um, you know, someone like Liz's calibre just showing everyone how great she is and talking a lot about our game uh, in the process. So, yeah, she, she's done an amazing job and she'll come back and do whatever she wants to do off the back of this. Mm. There's already been a stack of calls for her for PM, so we'll see how that plays out. <laughs> All right, well, you've already brought up Jamaica quite a lot there, Kath. Are they sort of the team or the country that you personally are most worried about heading into the World Cup? You obviously see a lot of them in the SSN. Well, yeah, and I think that's why I am so worried because we, we've seen them in action every week over here, which is probably a good thing too because there's a bit of reconnaissance going on, no doubt, from Stacey Marinkovic's point of view. But um, Shamira Sterling having the season of her life, if you thought it could get any better. Um, likewise, Latanya Wilson. And then can't forget Jody Ann Ward's down in Melbourne killing it, um, as is Shimona Nelson and, of course, Janiel Fowler. So they have got pretty much the whole side. They just need that mid-court. Um, we don't know what their mid-court's been up to. Obviously, they're all back in Jamaica. But um, no doubt, uh, that's, well, it's a quite important link, isn't it, really, yeah, through the mid-court. Very end. important. They get that's a chance right. over. <laughs> well, some, some would say. Yeah. <laughs> Um, got a, they will turn the ball over. It's a matter of them being able to get it down to their shooting end, and we know what they're going to do when they get it down there. So, yeah, once um, once they all come together over there in South Africa, I think there'll be a fair few eyes on that midcourt. And what about England, Kath? Because, I mean, you've got, well, Ellie Cardwell, you already, you know, mentioned her. Um, Joe Harton has, you know, stepped aside from the international game. Jeeva Mentor, I gather, is having yet again another <laughs> great season when, you know, so many people have, you know, written her off. Uh, and, of course, you've got, I think, Tanya Ops is coaching down there. And um, so what do you make of, of their uh, chances? Yeah, look, I think they're getting better and better too. Um, Cardwell has been a revelation for the Adelaide Thunderbirds, just being that strike shooter that we spoke about before, but also the confidence she brings. She's almost a little bit arrogant, and that's been really, <laughs> really good for the Adelaide Thunderbirds because I think they're really feeding off that sort of feel. Um, and don't forget Tracy Neville. I know she's not in that England environment anymore. I feel like she will be very shortly, oh, yeah. but she's working with the Adelaide Thunderbirds. And I think what they're getting from her, um, Ali Cardwell in particular, and then obviously Helen Housby, she's in, in Sydney as well, is playing with the New South Wales Swift. So there's plenty of England talent here. It is a real shame about Joe Harton not being there, but I think if they were smart, they would take her over in some sort of other capacity because she's such a leader and so important to them. Well, we love your intel, Kath. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Great to hear from you. You too. Thanks, guys. Well, Kath Cox seems to think Jamaica, the team to watch out for. Should we be nervous? Well, I think um, she... Like, not a surprise. You, uh, no, guess, not a yeah. surprise. And you can see that she... Yes, no, we'd be expecting that. And you can see that she is. But I think probably that's the thing with Australia, isn't it? I mean, they're, I mean, they're always super confident and all the rest of it. But they really can't afford to lose. I mean, they're a bit like the All Blacks in that, you know, the minute if they do drop a game, uh, it's like, oh, you know, the wheels have come off. And the, I mean, that must be huge pressure. I mean, you talk about pressure and, you know, Kath is talking about, obviously, Jamaica being the one to watch. In big moments, they're, the, they're often the team that, that, that yeah. crack under pressure, aren't they, the Jamaicans? Yes. So are we starting to see, you know, perhaps under pressure that they're starting to show a little bit more resilience and, and can absorb that pressure and get there? So... Um, yeah, I'm really interested to see if Jamaica can just crack crack it and, and get in that top spot. That's funny she talked about the midcourt because I know when I talk to some of the Ferns girls before they go away on a big tournament like this, they always say they're most nervous and most scared for Jamaica just because of their bookends. But do they need some of their midcourting players to be playing in our competition, playing in the SSN, to make that genuine next step?
But I wonder if they're not because they can't get a place. I mean, you know, when you think of the, the middies in um, Australia, well, well... And here. Jeepers. Yeah. 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 Interesting that's that that's she, right. Yeah, she said it's mid-court in Australia, and it's probably the mid-court here where yeah. there's the most competition. Most competition. But it's not a bad thing, you know. Th they'll be a little bit more of the unknown, the mid-court Jamaicans, whereas everyone knows what the defence and shooting end are going to be like. They'll be a little bit of the, ooh, what are they going to be like? Well, too, cast your mind back to Quad Series, not that long ago, January, and, you know, South Africa... Africa put out some quite, I, I was quite surprised at how, how well they played. And yes, you know, they've got Norma Plummer back there. Uh, and she seems to bring, you know, such confidence to that team. Plus, of course, the uh, return of Carla Pretorius yes. from having a baby. Huge. And she, oh, I, yes, I mean, there was just moments in that game, I think, against England that it, it was phenomenal. But yes, yeah, so don't count them out. And what about England? Can we count them out? I don't well, know how you're feeling about England. I was concerned by the mood that appeared to be within the England camp. I mean, there clearly seemed to be discord there. Um, whether or not that's been... Pa I mean, uh, I don't think Jess Thirlby will have had a chance to, you know, have her players to herself because they all go off to the... all over the world. But um, I agree with Kath. Ellie Cardwell <laughs> is amazing. And I was glad that she, she used the arrogant. word arrogant. She talking, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, she made that as a positive. Yes. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, you know... As only Australians would. <laughs> Come on. But, um, yeah, she, uh, there was a game that I watched between the Thunderbirds and the Fever, which because you knew that it was going to be a big game, and it was so exciting. And they, the Thunderbirds beat them, I think, by one goal or one point, mm. but it was on the back of Ellie Cardwell's two-point shoot, uh, mm. two shooting. So, you know, it, it sh Kath's right. It does bring just that other dimension. Um, I mean, I'm glad we don't have it. But uh, never mind. I mean, yeah, and, and in terms of England, um, well, who no, knows? No, no Joe Harton, but interesting she said that, you know, whether she, they would use Joe in some capacity because at the quad series, when she did get injured, remember, she That's right. left the team midway she through did. the series, which we thought was a bit odd. Mm. You know, why, would, why wouldn't you just stay around? And, um, but we did get wind that she was perhaps doing too much talking in the camp and the coach didn't like that. So it'll be interesting to see if, if Thilby does get her back in the team. And the wee tease that maybe we'll see Tracy Neville back in some capacity. So plenty to keep our eye on with mm. the English squad. Right before we wrap up this episode here at Inside Netball, we just would like to pay our respects to the late, great Tiny Jameson, a truly trailblazing figure of our sport, the first Silver Ferns coach to win a World Cup you know, Annie, Jenny, I'm sure you guys have fond memories of Tiny. Oh, she's just such a lovely lady. And the fact that she's got a trophy named after her, I think, says it all. Uh, she was actually my mother's coach back in, uh, my mum was in the Silver Ferns, 69 to 71. And I went and visited mum in Christchurch in the weekend. My mother has dementia. She doesn't remember much. She remembered her coach that had died during the week. So that was pretty special, you know, even, you know, mum at 75, she still remembers Tiny and um, with such fond memories. So, yeah, lovely lady. Yeah, well, I've only met her a couple of times at, at Tiny Jamison series, and she struck me as being that sort of person that, you know, when they talk to you, you feel like you are the most important person. And uh, I think, I, I made me wonder, I wonder if that's a trait that, uh, coaches have because you know Nolene Taurua has that same ability Lois Muir you know she grips your arm and you know looks you in the eye and and, and I just wonder if that's if that's a little something but um it's not perhaps a trait of all coaches but it's a trait of the good coaches of the really good coaches yes. there you go. yeah but um yes no I well I wasn't sad because she was 97, 97. 97. you know oh, what thanks. a wonderful life well lived Absolutely, and we're stoked to hear that the Silver Ferns will be honouring her with another Tiny Jamison series later in the year. That is all from us here on Inside Netball. We'll see you next week.